Good morning, everybody. Um, our opening hymn, as always, in the Soul Stirring Songs and Hymns, is going to be hymn number 11, He Died for Me. He Died for Me. Good to see you back. Um, I'm, I'm just going to sing the first verse, and then uh, we'll go on after that. Here we go. <clears throat> I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us uh, without his blood. None of us would be going to heaven. So, uh, not to be taken lightly. It is a good song. Great song, but the message is, uh, it uh, brings a tear to your eye. Um, Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is going to be our opening verse, and we're going to start halfway through the chapter in verse 7 and finish the chapter. The Bible says, uh, Psalm 27, verse 7. Here. O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Because of, uh, excuse me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Greetings, friends and colleagues. It's Sean Elvis. Um, Lord gave me another message to share with you guys today, so um, I'm happy to share it and I'm happy to see you. Sometimes things happen in our lives that we cannot avoid. You know, people come after us for things. They turn against us. Things that aren't even our fault. We never even did anything wrong. What I want to talk today about is the ninth commandment in the Bible. Say, what's the ninth commandment in the Bible, Sean? Exodus chapter 20 uh, has all the commandments. But verse 16 specifically is the ninth commandment. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You know, in, Psalm, in the opening reading in Psalms chapter 27, verse 12, it says, Deliver me not unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. False witnesses. False witnesses um, is against the ninth commandment. That's what we're talking about today. And the, you see, the will of our enemies is to be cruel to us. You know, sometimes we're going to have enemies who are just behind the scenes, behind the curtains, in the shadows, so to speak. But sometimes our enemies are going to rise up against us. They're going to fabricate lies against us, trying to hurt us, to destroy us. And the Bible tells us that, you know, if this happens, what are we supposed to do? Well, what's the end of uh, the psalm? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. So what is bearing false witness? Bearing false witness, in short, uh, the quick way is to say it's telling lies. Um, I hate liars. I hate liars. I hate when people lie. It's one of the worst things I hate. But, <clears throat> but bearing false witness is even worse than lying. 
Because it means that you're trying to get somebody in trouble. You're trying to get them punished for something that you know is not true. You know it's a lie. You know they didn't do it. Why would somebody do that? I mean, there are people that can convince themselves that you really are guilty. They become so delusional and so focused on destroying you that they'll believe their own lies. But... The question is, why Why would somebody uh, want to destroy you? Why would they want to bear false witness in the first place? And it's probably because they're jealous of you. Or, you know, it could be, and more likely, is that they're angry at you for something, right? Maybe something you said to them, or said about them, and maybe you didn't even talk to them. But it's just for what you stand for. You know, they feel threatened by what you stand for. You didn't do anything wrong, right? In fact... It's the complete opposite. They hate you because you did everything right. right? You remind them how bad they are. You know, in the case of the Bible and the story that we're going to look at today in the Bible, if you have a King James Bible, uh, you could o open up to the story of uh, Luke, the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 20, uh, chapter 23. That's where we'll be today. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk about the story of Barabbas. Barabbas being chosen over Jesus. And um, we're going to see how Barabbas was chosen to be let free instead of Jesus. And the reason I chose this story is because, you know, yes, uh, they did falsely accuse Jesus. But I want to focus in on the fact that there could be a Barabbas in our lives. Right? What I mean is there's a part of every single one of us that has a Barabbas inside of us, that wants to sin, that wants to do the wrong thing. You know, every moment in our lives, we're faced with a choice. Do we crucify our sin inside of us and we let Jesus free? Or do we crucify Jesus and let Barabbas free? So we're going to start here in Luke chapter 23. But before I, but before I go there, I just want to revisit Psalms one last time, Psalm 27, my opening verse, very briefly, and focus on verse 11 that says, Teach me thy ways, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. See, every one of us has enemies. We have an enemy out there. Whether they're trying to get us in trouble or not um, for something that we didn't even do that's wrong, right? Even when we're doing everything right, we're still going to have enemies, and these enemies will still manage to accuse you of doing something wrong, even when you didn't. That's why we need the Lord to teach us His ways. So we're going to ask the Lord to teach us His ways today and pray for wisdom. That's our remedy. You see, because the Lord, He's no stranger to false accusations, right? He knows all about how uh, we try to point fingers at God and blame Him for things that He never, he never did, right? Lord, it's your fault. You're the one. Who put that woman here with me? Adam, remember? If it wasn't for you creating this woman, I wouldn't be in this mess, right? Or what about Eve? Oh, it was that snake you created. Lord, he tricked me. It's all your fault for making this snake. See, God's no stranger to false accusations. So we want to learn. We want the Lord to teach us. How do we deal with false accusations when it happens? Let's take a look. Uh... We're going to be in Luke, what did I say, Luke chapter 23, and we're going to start, whoa, it's too far, in verse 13. We're going to start in verse 13, halfway through the chapter. I don't want this to go too long, so let's just read verse 13 here. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me, talking about Jesus, as one that uh, perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod. Herod's the king. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. So we see here that this indeed is a false accusation. Pilate even says, hey, I didn't find anything wrong with him. Even, even King Herod didn't find anything wrong with him. 
So both the highest leaders of their time agreed. Jesus was innocent. This is a false accusation. Let me tell you something. Just because you're innocent doesn't mean you're going to walk free. Okay? Sometimes God has a reason that he's going to allow you to become a martyr. Jesus even had the king himself declare his own innocence. And you say, well, Sean, I would never, I would never choose Barabbas over Jesus. But let me ask you something. Has there, any been, has there ever been a time in your life where you've known something was wrong? But beyond a shadow of a doubt, you knew it was wrong. And you did it anyways? And you justified yourself doing it too, right? I know I have. You know, I'm a sinner too, right? Um, so you, you tell yourself, oh, this is not that bad. You know, even though your heart uh, and your mind told you, you know, don't do that. That's wrong. Your flesh should... Shut up. We're going to do it. We're going to do it anyways. You know, it's going to feel good, right? It's going to be fun. What harm can happen? It's harmless. Yea, hath God said, thou shalt not surely die, right? That's how the devil gets us. He gets us to doubt if it's really bad. And he tries to convince us, oh, you know, this is, this is not that bad, right? We always think we can get away with it. Sweep it under the rug. Cover it up. With a false accusation. Make it look like we're doing the right thing. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 16. This is still Pontius Pilate talking. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feasts. And they cried out all at once saying, Away with this man and release unto us. Barabbas. You can only choose one. You can't release Jesus and Barabbas. You have to choose one. Our life is a constant choice of good and evil. We have to choose, do we want to release Jesus or Barabbas? Everybody, everybody knew that Barabbas was a known criminal. The Jews knew for certain that Jesus, he's not dangerous. At least not to the public, right? So why did the Jews choose Barabbas over Jesus? Because Jesus was a threat. You see, the Pharisees, they were hypocrites. And Jesus was constantly calling them out in public for being hypocrites, for being vipers, that's what he called them, for abusing their power. You see, on the outside, they appeared like they were holy because they knew how to put on this show of, of, of how godly they are. But Jesus, he started exposing them. And let me tell you something. There are corrupt people of this world, people of high status who hold office, who are in authority and have power. And if you start preaching the truth of God's word, you start exposing them, they're going to come after you. Now, they don't really care uh, about people who, you know, aren't really, um, don't have a loud voice, don't aren't famous um, and they're especially not going to care about people who, you know, or just praise them and give them validation and recognition. I mean, if you keep your mouth shut, they're not going to come after you, right? Because after all, that's what they're looking for. They're seeking to be glorified. But if you start exposing them for their hypocrisy and their lies, you start threatening their status, their authority, their, their position in office, you start speaking the truth. People start listening to you. The second you become a threat to them or making them look bad, that's when they're going to come after you. One way or the other, they'll come after you. And usually they'll try to do it subtly at first so it doesn't appear like they're, they're just straight up attacking you. You know, one of the things they'll do is they'll, is they'll look for any small little reason to accuse you of anything, right? Like, like right now we have the president debates going on. Uh, they're selecting a new president, and and every, both sides are slinging dirt at the any little piece of dirt they could find at the other guy. They throw it back at the other guy and say, "This guy did this. Well, this guy did this, right?" So they'll look for any reason. But see, the thing is with Jesus, they couldn't find a reason. He was the perfect sinless man, right? He never did anything wrong his whole life. 
So they had no choice but to fabricate a lie. And that's what your enemies will do to you. They will fabricate lies against you. They'll falsely accuse you. Let's continue reading verse 18. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, release us unto Barabbas, who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. So this is a known murderer. This is a known murderer. So why did they choose to release a known murderer? Because they hated Jesus. And they'll hate you too. You start preaching about Jesus. You start preaching this book. They're going to hate you. It's just a matter of time. Don't believe me? Clean up your life. Start obeying the Bible. Start preaching the Bible. And you're going you're gonna to watch your friends start to disappear. You're going to watch your closest family uh, members start to walk away from you. They don't want to associate themselves with you. John 15 verse 18 says, If the world hates you, Know that it hated me before it hated you. Because if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. See, when you stand for the Bible, when you stand for Jesus Christ, it's not you they're hating. They hate God. That's who they're hating. See, the world represents evil. It represents sin and unholiness and everything... Uh, of the world is, is the devil. It doesn't mean like things like baseball and, and, and things like that are evil. But it, it, it's a metaphor. The world is a metaphor for evil. And you know, see the devil, he hates Jesus because Jesus testifies to the wickedness of the devil. So anytime you speak the truth to somebody, you stand up for Jesus. You expose the ungodliness. They're either one, they're, they're either going to hate you, or they're going to thank you. And if they hate you, be careful. Because there's no limit what they will do to destroy you. Because hate leads to murder. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 20. Uh, verse Yeah, verse 20. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. That means he's just going to whip him, give him a beating, and then let him go. And even that he didn't deserve. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. So Pilate gave in to them. And he released unto them him for that sedition of murder was cast into prison whom they had desired. So they released Barabbas. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Jesus was condemned wrongfully for death. The story is heartbreaking. Not just because Jesus was falsely accused and sentenced to death, but look, you know, Pilate even gave the Jews three opportunities to change their minds. A lot of the times before we choose to do evil in our lives, God will give us an opportunity to do the right thing. Don't waste those opportunities. Do the right thing. I mean, putting somebody to death wrongfully, torturing them, that's, that's one of the worst things imaginable, right? Not punishing somebody for doing something wrong, I mean, that's pretty bad too, you know? There are a lot of rape accusations and, 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 uh, that go unpunished, you know, and that's a tragedy. When justice fails, that's, that, that doesn't feel good, but you know, I almost feel like it's even more tragic when you accuse somebody of doing something they didn't do. A false rape accusation. And then you punish that man. You sentence him to death. You make him pay the ultimate price with his life. I mean, I couldn't imagine it, right? I mean, I've been accused of things I haven't done before, but but never put to death for it, right? So I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, I would I would probably see myself fighting back. You know, Jesus, he didn't fight back. 
you know, but, but Jesus, I don't think this story here is designed to teach us not to defend ourselves when we get uh, falsely accused, not to stick up for yourselves. Remember, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. He had to lay down his life for us to cleanse us of our sins. This was his mission in life. So the, I don't think the moral of the story here is is not to defend yourself. I think the moral of the story here is to trust in God. Like Psalm said, you know, Jesus knew that he can trust in the Lord. That God would resurrect him from the dead. You know, he knew that if he went through with this, our sins could be saved. Our sins would be paid for. You know, Psalm 27 says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. That's what the Bible says. So let me ask you something. Would you die for somebody that you love to save them? Would you endure the humiliation? Would you suffer the torture, the false accusation, the lies? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Because he loved us. And don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying... Um, that the Bible teaches that if we're falsely accused, that we should just roll over and die, right? You know, but I will say this, if it did happen, if you did get falsely accused and, and you were wrongfully put to death, you know, would you blame God or would you just trust him? Would you just trust him? Would you wait on the Lord? That's what Jesus did. He waited because I think, you know, through prayer. Through prayer, through fasting, you know, God could use even our own death, our wrongful death for something great. You know, and maybe we didn't die. Maybe we were just falsely accused and humiliated. And uh, But I think God could even use that, that false accusation for his honor and his glory if we wait, if we trust him. You know, because eventually, you know, justice will be administered by God one way or the other, you know. It may not come in the form of the way that you expect it or you want it or at the time you want it, but eventually God will make it right. God always makes it right. So in closing, I want to close today. And and what did I talk about today? I talked about false accusations, but but <clears throat> more important uh, what I wanted to stress was that, you know, in our lives, we always need to choose Barabbas or Jesus, good or evil. So let's try to make sure that, you know, that we aren't falsely accusing other people in our lives, right? Who, who are speaking the truth. And that we're not creating excuses to not do things that are right. Don't create an excuse to let the sin out of your life, to let Barabbas free. The only thing that's holding you back, and me, from doing the right thing is us, ourselves. You can change it. Just like Jesus. See, you're never going to stop a false accusation. You can't stop that. You have nothing to do with that. But what we can choose to do is how we respond to it. Are we going to get angry? Are we going to blame God? Or are we going to wait on the Lord and trust Him? Are we going to uh, let our, our flesh rule us and, and go to the things of the world and sin out of frustration, out of hopelessness, or are we going to put our faith in God and trust that so long as we obey Him, we wait on the Lord, we submit ourselves to Him, that He is powerful enough to deliver us and give us justice. That choice remains entirely up to you. That's my message for the day, guys. Let's close in prayer. And then, um, as always, I'll be giving God the last word. And I think we'll be in uh, uh, Romans. Romans chapter 8. Um, let's bow in prayer, <clears throat> if you would, please. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this message today. I thank you for enduring the humiliation on the cross for us and paying the ultimate sacrifice. Father, we thank you for always being honest with us, Lord. We never have to worry about you falsely accusing us of 
doing something wrong and we thank you for chastising us when we do 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 wrong because you want us to get it right father we ask that you forgive us all the wrongdoings that we have done in the past have mercy on us lord lord we're going to trust you even more we're going to submit to you and we're going to wait for your righteousness your holiness your miracles So that when wicked people of this world come to destroy us, we know that you'll be there with us. You'll take care of us. Lord, I ask that you bless the people who hear this message. Keep them safe from any and all harm. Not just to their bodies, Lord, but to their reputation, to their testimony. For your glory. We're all trying to keep a good testimony for you, Lord. So help us unite together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Help unite us, Lord. Help us overlook the things of our brothers and sisters that maybe we don't like. Help us forgive one another and come together for your glory, Lord, and really unite us. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do. Thank you for this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And as always, I'm going to give God the last word. So we're going to be in, what I say, Romans, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Uh, 31 through 39, it's through the end of the chapter. God bless, have a good day. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God, or excuse me, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, nakedness, or peril, or the sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.